This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. Com. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra five dollars off the first year's annual subscription sign up at historyfix.com and use promo code gettysburg every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial escape into history with history fix the 1863 civilians of gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle join ken rich the man in the red shirt for his historic town walking tours you could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com that's ken at gettysburg townhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit civilwartrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. It's louder than I normally have it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. Today, we are talking about Perry's Brigade, or the Florida Brigade, if you will. Um, With us, as always, not as always, but as often as possible is uh, our friend Lewis Trot. Hello, Lewis. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, Lewis. I didn't unmute you. Hello again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Louis, we have a we have a guest with us today, uh, a new guide to the show, Kevin Bryant. Hello, Kevin. Hey, how is everybody? Uh, now, Kevin, you're going to have to make that voice a little higher so that I sound like the deep voiced uh, <laughs> person here. Hey, how's yeah. everybody yeah. doing? If you could talk like Mickey Mouse, that would be uh, much appreciated. I my inner peach. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do the Barry Gibb falsetto for the rest of the show, if you don't mind. Now, Kevin, welcome to Justin Gettysburg. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Yeah, great to be here. I saw you on. Uh, Facebook, I think you came up as a suggestion, and I saw that it, you know, it said licensed battlefield guide, and you're a pretty young guy. How old are you? I'm 37. 37. Are you the youngest guide out? No, Jesse Wheedleton. I think is. she's. I don't know exactly how old she is, but I think she's a little bit younger. Jesse Wheedleton's 22. She'll always be. <laughs> she told me to say that she's 22. I think every there's year. another guide in there the same age range. Age age range. I think, yeah, I think, range. There I think there's yeah, about yeah. three of us who are probably within that yeah. same general area. Okay, so, okay. I know when I first got the license and taken into the guide room, well, the folks, when they introduced me, a bunch of the guys were sitting around, they stood up, and he said, you just brought the average age down by 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, how long have you been a guide? I got 2018. 2018, I'm okay. Really close to my fifth anniversary in two weeks. Very nice. Yeah. Congratulations. And uh, how are you liking it so far? I love it. This yeah. is amazing. Somebody once told me once, the key to happy life, find what you love, and then find somebody to pay you to do what you love. Yeah, it's so true. I stumbled into it. It's true, because not only do you do guiding, but what else do you, what do you do? What's your real job? Yeah, so I just do licensed battlefield and guiding part-time. Also full-time, I work for the National Park Service down in Washington, D.C. I'm Good. Park rangers down So, there. So you're just all around is history. You're making money doing history. I love it. And I, you're and you're, you're happy doing it. 14-year-old me would have been ecstatic to <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> Never would have believed it. And are you a married man, single man? I am. I'm married, have two kids. Married, two kids. Yep. Wow, 37 years old, married, two kids right, He's a guide and a ranger. Yeah. He needs some money. <laughs> 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 That's true. And are your kids into history or are they too young yet? Not so much at this point. I think they're, yeah. they're more uh, Pokemon. P- a Pokemon. Know. Okay. What, what are they, like eight years eight, old? Nine. Eight, nine. Eight, okay. Eight, yeah. Where are you Soon. from? I grew up in the Midwest. Oh, okay. So I lived out there for the beginning part of my life and then took off after college. Wisconsin, Minnesota. Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Close enough. 
Um, Does it drive you nuts when people call it Illinois? Yeah, noisiest state in the union. <laughs> it drives me nuts when they call it Illinois. And I've known people from Illinois who call it Illinois. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe we're all wrong. I don't know. I don't know. Is it Worcester or Worcester? <laughs> Depends on if you're cooking with it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and nobody knows how to pronounce it anyway. <laughs> Which I just or yeah. Arkansas. Give me that good sauce over there. Yeah. Uh, all right. And so, uh, do you uh, have you listened to the show, or are you? Oh no, you have, right? Yeah, you said, I've yeah. listened to the okay. show a bunch of times. All right. So you're familiar with how it goes and everything, right? Hopefully. All right. We'll Thirty seconds out. on the clock. Let's see who gets the. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, let's get started here with uh, Perry's Brigade. First question I have about Perry's Brigade before we get into it. It's Perry's brigade, but Lang is the commander here. Perry is uh, sick, right? He's recuperating. Yeah, yeah caught typhoid um, after Chancellorsville. I don't know if he caught it after Chancellorsville, but the effects got him yeah. after Chancellorsville. So Colonel David Lang is going to lead. And he's from the 8th um, Florida Regiment. But now, isn't there a brigade uh, over in... Uh, is it Nichols' brigade? That is actually Hoax Brigade, but we call it Nichols Brigade. Am I, what am I thinking? Over in Johnson's division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So generally when I'm talking about this, I always say Lang. Mm -hmm. Lang. Because he's the guy on it. But, but, but it seems yeah. that like technically we refer to it as Perry's Brigade, but Perry wasn't here. Lang was in command. Yep. But then with Hoax Brigade, Hoax wasn't here. Nichols was in command, but some, I see it sometimes both, or no, I see it as Nichols Brigade. It's like Avery. Isaac Avery was a temporary commander right. of that brigade. Of Hoax Brigade? Yes. Okay, I'm confusing and, Nichols. Yeah. And, okay, thank you for and correcting we, me 20 minutes into it. <laughs> I I always just go by who's the guy here. But that's what I'm saying, is who's the guy here, right? Lang. Uh, yeah. Right, but it seems with... I guess what I'm saying is we. it doesn't seem that this is like uh, the, the, the uniform rule that we name it after the guy who was here. With Perry's Brigade, because I okay, I see I it often referred to yeah. as Perry's Brigade, yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas I rarely see oh. Avery's Brigade called Hoax Brigade. Yeah, yeah. we always... Even though I think on the plaque, Avery. it's Hoax Brigade, isn't that right? But that, yeah, that's an official plaque. Right. Though. Yeah, yeah. So I what's Perry's Brigade? The, the government would do that. <laughs> I do too. What's Perry's Brigade on the plaque? Is it Perry or, or Lang? Like Perry. Probably Perry, but we don't know. Yeah, I know? can't remember. I think it's Perry. It's Perry. Yeah. Because it's the official. All right. Right, if you're following the order of battle or things, you're using the official names. And yeah. Otherwise, for us, just when you want to sound impressive. Right. <laughs> show off of okay. David Lang, but do you know who it really was? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if the audience, if I, if I just confused you, now you know how I feel. Okay? Okay. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give us uh, a little bit of a background on Perry's Brigade, whoever wants to go. I don't care. doesn't matter to me. Go ahead, Kevin. So Perry's Brigade is going to have its foundation as it's being formed 1861 Perry is going to be leading things forward just the second Florida. Okay. It starts off as just one regiment. They're going to serve full year or so, and then in the events after the Seven Days campaign, others, you get additional Florida regiments that are joining the fight and coming in. And they merge together into a brigade, but it's not what we know as the Florida Brigade initially. Okay. They go together into a guy named Pryor. Uh -huh. Serve together in Antietam, events like that. So they're added to Pryor's Brigade, in other yes. words? Okay. With a couple other states involved. Right. Right, yeah. It's not so they're not fully Florida. Florida. Starts off just that one, Florida the second, and then you get the fifth and the eighth in addition to other states joining. And then it's after Antietam, the Florida Brigade, as we're going to know it in the Gettysburg context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. The second, the fifth, and the eighth. So they're separated and put under Perry after Antietam. Right. Right. Got it. Yes. All right. That's the show. There we go. All right. So then... Uh, Antietam, the Fredericksburg, are they involved in Fredericksburg? Yeah, they see a lot of conflict across okay. the first couple battles. Take a lot of casualties? They take the most at the Seven Days campaign. Okay. From about May 1st through July 1st of 62, just when it's just the second alone, they're going to suffer like 400 casualties. Wow. And they're the never that big to begin with. Right. So, but they're just getting thrown in. Yeah, because they're really tiny when they get here. Mm -hmm. They're like the Irish Brigade about of the Army of Northern Virginia. About 700 soldiers when they get here. Yeah. 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 yeah, and they've just they. There's a quote, and it's it's after um, the third day, I think, where a Union soldier finds a, a wounded Florida soldier out by the Emmitsburg Road, and he comes upon him, and the 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 guys probably die in the Florida fella, and he starts bemoaning the fact that whenever General Lee needs anybody, he always calls for the Fifth Florida mm -hmm. and throws him in. Oh, really? So, yeah. Huh. 
All right, and so uh, why did Lee have a problem with Florida? What was so? Why did he always, were they just I, I, that good? I think that's what that soldier thought because uh, he's always in combat and they're always losing men. Right, it's okay. just a perception he had yeah. from his own little world. And think of the track record of what he's seeing there too. Seven days, they're so mauled up, they're not even being used at Malvern Hill. You get them then. Second Manassas, the one case where they're kind of sitting things out. Antietam, they're right there diving into the sunken road, mm-hmm. suffering massive casualties there. You've got them pushing forward in Fredericksburg. They're right there guarding kind of the pontoon bridges. They're some of the first to get cut off after yeah, they're, surrendering. They're that down occasion. there with the right. Mississippians, Yep, you know, trying to keep the Federals from coming across the river. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And so uh, so Chancellorsville, what, what goes on with them at Chancellorsville? Yeah, so when Lee's going to split the army, send Jackson over to the left of Florida is basically the right end of the line there. They're a big part of that effort of making sure the Federals don't do anything. So they got to keep so they're the holding fake attacking force. over and over. They're yeah. the holding force. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. They're going to suffer more in that role, too. So when this guy's saying, General Lee's always putting us in the front, it's sure kind of looking like yeah, it. it feels like it. Right. Yeah, I can see Especially that. Especially in light of what we know is coming here on these days in Gettysburg. Do, um, what did they, st- you said they weren't a big brigade when they started. How many were they roughly? Do you know? I can't. Yeah, I don't know the, the figure, but I know they weren't that big compared to some other states. Because I mean, they were three regiments? W- I mean, were the regiments close to full strength at any point, or yeah, was the population of Florida the not that big? second actually had 12 companies, uh-huh. um, and I think the eighth, when they joined, they have 11 companies. I think so. I think that's yeah, so they've got more than um, the standard 10 companies, but I don't, I'm not sure that they're all full strength. They just never seem that big. Um, and some of these troops are from Georgia. Like, Lang is from Georgia. Mm-hmm. He went to Georgia Military Institute. Um, and then he joins in the war effort. So, and then Perry is from Massachusetts. Really? He went to Yale. Um, and then he's a lawyer down uh, in Florida when everything breaks out. So he's so a he legion. Stays. Yeah, and he marries somebody down there, I think. Um, yeah, I've seen some figures that say only about one third of the regiment's actually native Floridians. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or, or the brigade, rather. Was Florida's population that large at that point? Or? No, because no. the southern end of Florida. Nobody is, I think is a lot of wilderness and stuff. A lot of uh, the first soldiers that joined the brigade come from the Panhandle area mm-hmm. over to the east. Okay. Um, there was a big recruiting effort. They showed up at Disney World, uh, handed out leaflets, but everybody was having so much fun. Ah, no, I'd like to ride, so I'd stay here. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. I make yeah, all good. No, Florida's not, got the smallest population in the whole Confederacy. Yeah, okay. it's because of that, close. the southern close. southern portion is just you know wilderness, it's a swamp and wilderness, yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 and alligators. It's not as populated as the rest. Okay, all right, so. Uh, uh, no, okay. Blah, 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 what is the name? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get to Gettysburg then. How do they get to Gettysburg? What happens when they're at Gettysburg? What do they do on the first day? Are they fighting at all? Or well, before that, I think we go back. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. When Lee has to divide his army up into the three, because yeah. I think this plays into the story, a part of the problem. All right, go ahead. Especially on the second day, Lee divides his corps up into three different corps. He's got two new corps commanders, A.P. Hill and then Richard Yule. Uh huh. Um, and he moves Richard Anderson from Longstreet over to the new Corps of AP Hill. And then the Florida Brigade is going to be under Anderson. When Anderson was under Longstreet, he did, he did decently enough. He did fairly well. But Longstreet was like, I don't know if it's micromanaging him, but he was making sure Anderson was doing well. You know, he's putting him where he needed to be and giving him instructions and stuff like that. He was, uh, supervising properly he goes from that anderson does to being under ap hill who's a sickly fella Mm -hmm. especially here at gettysburg so anderson is kind of like left to his own devices he's given all right you're going to extend the line on the second day you know let's extend the line south down seminary ridge that's easy enough to follow but once the, the the salts are launched you know anderson doesn't really play a big part and that becomes part of the problem. So I think it's important in the context of what they're going to do specifically on the second day um, and the third day to a point. They're under this guy, Richard Anderson, who previous to this battle was under Longstreet, who got proper leadership above him. Now he's under somebody that's not going to give that proper leadership because he's sick, APL. Mm-hmm. So, 
And that's hugely significant, too, because Hill being kind of this little bit hands-off commander, whether by choice yeah. or not here, it gives not only Anderson a chance to prove, like, dude, this is your moment, can you handle it? But it also then falls down to Lang. Mm-hmm. Like, with the confusion or with the unclear orders, as far as you want them that you're receiving, how are you going to respond to this? Right. I think both of these guys are going to respond in perhaps different ways. Yes, I agree with that. Saying, yeah. How do I carry out my understanding of my orders to the best of my ability? Maybe I'm going to nail it, and maybe I'm going to fall flat on my face. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is that moment. This is the trial. All right. So then we get to Gettysburg. They are at Gettysburg. Um, yeah, they're the last first, to get here. The first day they're at Fayetteville, not North Carolina. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> that's the only Fayetteville <laughs> they're I They're making knew. their way up from Florida. I lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina for 21 years, so that's my Fayetteville. Uh, that was a dump. Um, <laughs> uh, no offense to our Fayetteville no offense, listeners. But anybody who lives there knows I'm right. <laughs> it's gotten better over the years. I haven't been there in about 10 years or so. I don't know. Um, but they spend that first day at Fayetteville before they start moving up. Um, and they are in. And the, that's it, between here and Chambersburg for people who don't know. Yes. Um, no, no, no. It's about 19 miles. Yeah, away. yeah, yeah. It's, but it's further out than Cashtown. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. It's I'm between, not saying it's directly in between. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. it's yes. between um, here and Chambersburg. So that's where that the first day they don't take part in any of the fighting on the first day. They're bringing up the rear. Um, and then when Lee wants to extend the line south on Seminary Ridge with A.P. Hill's troop, he's part of Anderson's division. Anderson's division is going to move down and extend that line. Um, they are second from the last in the extension of that line. Um, Wilcox, Alabamians are on the far right of the Confederate line at this point, And then it's Lang's Floridians. Um, Anything else to add? Yeah, I think the key thing is, especially when you're talking about that source of the guys, is General Lee always puts us in the front. Yeah. At least on this occasion, they're bringing up the rear. Yeah, okay. Of specs, walking into Gettysburg, so they're choking on dust <laughs> this whole journey and guarding the wagon trains. Right. And they roll on in, setting up on her ridge where Pender and others had recently been. But the whole time they're coming in, they're hearing, you know, the sounds, the explosions, right. the booms. Like, they know what's happening, but... For them, it's just dust just, and choking. Yeah, they're just not going to make it. Right. Yeah. So in that they're, case, they're not first yeah. to the front, but they're soon going to be. <laughs> and then right. eventually, they, like all these units that are bringing up the rear, they start running into the casualties. Yeah. And they know it's been a hard first day. Yeah. They didn't see it happen, but they can see the remnants of it. All right. Uh, don't they bivouac on Hers Ridge, like you said, right? Yeah. So they're basically laying amongst some of the casualties that are probably still up there, if there were any laying dead around that area. But like uh, they've been brought back to the area, various field hospitals and stuff. Yeah. So right, and they're seeing everything coming back, and yep. maybe they're wandering out to McPherson's Ridge or something yeah. like that. Who knows? But yeah. they're seeing there. They know something big happened, yeah. and it ain't over yet. And so July second comes along, and where are they positioned? Like Lewis is saying, they're going to begin their journey from Her Ridge and start heading down Seminary Ridge. And whereabouts on Seminary Ridge will they go? Well, they're getting into position. Unfortunately for them, there was a really conveniently located Florida monument. So they need just to stop right there. <laughs> That's, there are like place markers you do for graduations and stuff. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. Well, you put the little stick in the ground. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they're, they're <clears throat> by the Henry Spangler farm um, west of it. Yep. Sorry, I had to, it took me a second. It's not assuring when there's a little bit of delay there. <laughs> I just wasn't, I didn't think you were such a jokester. I had to, now I'm ready for the next one. Go ahead, Lewis. I'm so, sorry. Uh, uh, right is on their right, and then it's the Florida Brigade. Then, um, excuse me, right. Wilcox is on the right, yeah. then the Florida Brigade, and right is on their left. So you have Georgians, Floridians, and Alabamians All right. coming down the line. Okay. So, and it's, Right around the Florida Monument. So a little, little south of the Bliss Farm. Well, a good deal south Pretty of the Bliss much. Farm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. west, just shortly west of Henry Spangler's Farm. Right, so where their monument yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, like, like they're going to launch their attack from just north, I don't know, next to, and we'll stand there in um, June. The, the land actually slopes down. If you... If you walk from the Emmitsburg Road, walk west to the Henry Spangler Farm, it goes up and down. But once it gets to the Spangler Farm, it slopes down into this gully. Like, um, I don't know what other word to use. I'm not that smart. Um, But when you stand there, you cannot see the Emmitsburg Road, and they're in that area. When they launch their July 2nd assault, they cannot see the road in front of them. The Emmitsburg Road. The Emmitsburg Road. So they're there. Again, to their left is uh, right, and to their right is Wilcox. 
Um, yeah, if you ever get the chance, you should go walk through. Well, you, I don't know when this is coming out in relation to the tour, but uh, you know, if it's before the tour, you should come and join us uh, so that you can see what Lewis is talking about there. Because you, yeah, you can't. You're like in a bowl. Yeah. Uh, in some places, and you can't see out, which means they can't see you. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to go up um, to um, the Virginia Monument, walk the path down to the waysides. Out, yeah, the out, point of woods. Down to the point of woods. But you hang a right where the woods end, and you just walk along that wood line. Every once in a while, look to your left, and the road will disappear. Yeah. And because of that. It really gives you a sense of how that land is. And that land hasn't changed all that much, I don't think. They Around the, the farm. Yeah, they didn't do the tank trials, you know. Right. They did that further north. Yeah. Um, so that land, I think, got smoothed out some. But around the Henry Spangler farm, I think it's pretty much like it used to be. Yeah. And they right. Still, there was no POW camp on the Spangler no, farm. No, they, they still grow crops there, but you're just doing normal crop growing right. stuff. It's not going to You're affect, scratching the surface. Yeah, you know? it's not going to affect the land. But like I say, when they start their assault... They can't see the road because they're down into this this depression area. Swale. There's the word. <laughs> Look at there. <laughs> I was waiting. I was letting you hang for a you while. You must be a radio. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just and, an idiot. And what Lewis is describing here is the perfect moment talking about the view of why, if you want to experience this place, you got to get out of the car. Uh, thank you, you. If you are seeing that beautiful, 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 beautiful. Oh, oh, great job, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, I want you to be a regular part of this show. You, <laughs> yeah. you, I don't need to tell that you to do great. anything. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> That's it. If you see that view and you are in your car, you are doing it wrong. <laughs> That's You're right. You're completely so. I you got to get in there because there's no replacement. As cool as it is driving around the battlefield and seeing these things, you know, exploring. You got to venture off, yeah. even sometimes off the paths, maybe, yeah. to really get those views. Because especially with what Lang and others are going to be talking about, you know, these different hills he's describing. And if you're just in the car, you're like, what on earth is what he is talking, talking about? about? It looks yeah. so flat. Yeah. yeah. So you venture out there, and you're like, oh. Yeah. Because okay. if you park at that monument and you look left, your left, um, towards the east, you just see woods. Yeah, it's just trees. And then an open field there with more trees. But that gives you no sense it's just the monument there that tells their story but it, you don't experience their story right. standing there staring at that monument uh, uh, kevin say that again about the get out of the car tour. <laughs> <laughs> say, say that again what you just said to experience the battlefield you got to get out of the car <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> what's up bob no electricity yeah. We got that big heat. Actually, I could turn this off if you yeah, want. Turn it off if you like about, to. I don't how care. How do I turn it off? Just have a good tour, Bob. Switch it to off? <clears throat> yeah, usually that turns it off. Well, I don't want to do anything to mess it up. <laughs> I don't want to blow up either. No, me neither. All right, I went all the way over. All right, good. All right. <laughs> I was freezing earlier. So. All right, so where were we? Uh, <laughs> where are they at on the did... second day? I'll, uh, you can take it away. I put them, oh, put them where they're supposed to be. I was going to make a bad joke, so... <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting here saying you don't want to blow up, and that's what's going to happen. So yeah, guys, that's where that's that. very <laughs> So they're getting into position down there, and an important thing to keep in mind, the context of the time and place, they are basically the end of the Confederate line. Right. So everything we know coming with Longstreet marching around. Good. Like, okay. Yeah, let's not there yet. Let, let's set the stage. Good. I'm glad you brought that up. So Longstreet isn't there yet. We don't have McClaws and Hood in line. Um, Anderson's getting into line, right? He's filing into yeah. the right of... Uh, uh, um, Wright and and Perry and Wilcox, right? Or is it? Yeah, yeah, right, right. yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, and, and so. All that stuff is so. You so you, as you're pointing out, they are the end of the Confederate line in the morning, right? Uh, well, what, what time does what time does yeah? Well, Wilcox, right? What time does uh, Anderson start filing in after them to the right of Wilcox, roughly? Well, Anderson, Wilcox is the end of Anderson. I'm sorry. I, I have so many names. Okay. Let's try this again. What time does Wilcox get into place? Is that what you're asking? That's what I'm asking. I think that's about 10 a.m. Yeah, and, and it's important. I don't want to get into it too deeply because we can do it another time because it's the get out of the car tour. When Wilcox comes down there, that's when he runs into some of uh, uh, Sickles' mm-hmm reconnaissance force that he sent out there the sharpshooters in the third main right they're in uh pitzer's woods right or wilcox's alabamians are going to have a little skirmish with them which is also another tour that we're doing this yeah. year 
You see a theme developing, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> we're going to get out of the car again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to get out. Okay. So they're, uh, right. Okay. So they're, they're down there. So I guess we just want to stress the point that. It's the end of the line. Right until is the or Wilcox. I keep saying. I wish they changed. I know. Get a different letter there. Right I got the map the right in front of me, and I'm screwing Wilcox it up. is is on the far right, then Lang, and then and right. Then right. Yeah. So, okay, so you're going from when you when you when you say that in I'm case people right don't know right from left, you're also going south to north. Yes. Okay. It's easy for us to lose track of because we don't hear about this as much. We don't have strong Vincent rolling around going, "You the end of the line." Right. Right. We don't have that. Right. And it's not in the movie at all. Not if Jeff Daniels had been down there, see, I'd remember. Of course. Yes. <laughs> if Jeff Daniels had been in Humphrey's division. Well, that's all I talk about. Uh, yes. All right. Now. That's it. Okay. About 10 o'clock. Yeah, like yeah. you said, it's probably about 10 o'clock. All right. And that little firefight's busting out, like you're saying, with some of the sickles for things. And Lang at first is being told, you know, you go bail him out, you know, go or you might need. You might need, yeah. To, yeah. to get over there. And, and then on the way, he gets notification. Yeah. Nah, we don't need you. Nah, that's right. not good. Yeah, it's no big deal. All right. So, um, so what else then? Uh, there, Sickles' line is forming uh, eventually, uh, and, and Longstreet is moving his men down, and that fighting is going to take place. Do Wilcox, Lang, and Wright, do they have orders to join Longstreet's attack at all, or are they just going to sit there as spectators? So Lang is at first ordered to throw some skirmishers forward yeah. and just kind of cover the front area, but... I don't know if it's exactly clear how well aware they are of the broader battle plan for that day, but eventually becomes clear this in echelon attack is going to be taking shape. And Lang's instructions are basically whatever Wilcox does, do that, just do it a little bit later. Right. He gets a weird order saying that you're to, I guess, I forget the wording, like coordinate with Wilcox or something like that, yeah. and you'll receive no further orders. So that's, that's on the third. the third day. Oh, that's the third. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm jumping we, ahead. All right. Yeah. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But that does kind of connect a little bit with the second, though that specific order is the third. Throughout this whole thing, you've almost got like this one super brigade, in a sense, operating. Lang and Wilcox are really well connected, even if not administratively. And this... Because there's some ambiguity, I can never say that. I always try, but ambiguity <laughs> to the to what they're supposed to do. You compare that to Longstreet, and it takes them a while to get in place and all that. But once they get in a place, the way Longstreet launches those brigades with depth, that's what smashes Sickles' line. Yeah, and if you, if that. Active participation of leadership is carried north on the Confederate line. I think they could carry the day. Um, who knows? You know, it's hindsight looking back. But if you look at Longstreet and his he didn't want it to happen. But once it gets going, he's all in. He doesn't do anything, in my estimation, wrong. Once it gets going, when, but when it goes up, the next division commander is Anderson. Longstreet's not taking charge of Anderson mm -hmm. like he is his own division commanders. AP Hill is who knows where, but it's, you know, the orders would have been given to Anderson. This is what we want you to do. And he would send the, the instructions down to the brigade. And I don't think he does a very good job communicating to his brigade commanders um, what they're supposed to do. There's some reports. He gets the, the, the picket treatment that happens the third day. Where is he at? Nobody knows. You know, he's back in the woods doing whatever. Um, same stuff they said about picking on the third day, but um, it's the, the the orders are sort of vague about what they're going to do, other than stay on the left of Cadmus Wilcox's Alabamians, support them, and then come in on their left. Then would be Ambrose Wright's brigade. So yeah, I think like you're saying, this is Richard H. Anderson's chance. Yeah, kind of show what he's got that medal that he may not have received directly clear orders specifying all the details, but that's within some of his prerogatives to still make the movement forward, make it happen, and maybe it starts great on his right side, but as things are maybe trickling over to his left, like saying he's getting this picket treatment, supposedly according to some aides, you know, he's just hanging out, you know, in this little ravine behind Seminary Ridge, you know, who knows if that's really going on. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Picnic. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just enjoying, you know, the old shad bake. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going, I wish they had shad up here. Yeah. So, uh, now, I just want to go back to something. Uh, so, you, do you not consider... The Confederates to have carried the day on July 2nd at all? No. No. They captured useless ground. 
True, but they well, it, they didn't. It's not useless for artillery. Well, it's not. The great only spot either. they ever capture is the peach orchard that they can use again. Devil's Den is useless. I think um, Little Round Top would have been mostly useless with the Sixth Corps coming up behind that. Sure. Um, they they put the peach orchard to use, and that's it. But they but they have well. Maybe you can say if they're more aware of what's going on. But they're at a disadvantage still over on Culp's Hill when they get into the, the the entrenchments down on the southern portion of the hill. But even then, they have no artillery support over there to support anything For, further sure, on. Yeah. But I think, I mean, they're. But I guess, I see. I consider it like half of carrying the day because they're squeezing in a little bit on the Union line. They're closer, you know, the Devil's Den is closer to the Union line than the Emmitsburg Road is or uh, Warfield Ridge is. Um, so I mean, and and they've inflicted tremendous casualties. They basically had, made the third corps useless. They've had tremendous casualties inflicted upon them, sure, sure. and they can't afford it. That's a good point. Okay, I just all think right, okay. Almost is not good enough for the Confederates here at Gettysburg. It right. has to be, the, you know, almost on the first day. Uh, no, I, I see what you're saying. Almost is good if you've got enough reinforcements to exploit. The, almost to make it a, a total, a total yeah. win. And while, but he doesn't have that. No, he has one fresh division after the second day, whereas the Union has a full, the biggest that they have full core, right. basically unused. They just wore out for marching over 30 miles, but they're, they haven't suffered any casualties or anything. You, they've got a lot more held in the tank than the Confederates do come day three. All right. And I, I think what I you're it. saying, Matt, is kind of in line with what... Uh, what I imagine Robert E. Lee's conviction is by the night of the second. I mean, that idea of, you know, we took this forward position, you know, we hammered him, we nailed the casualties, yeah. and then there's those other counterchallenges. But Lee doesn't seem to really be processing his amount of casualties. Right. The full degree. Like, right. Oh, well, we'll just continue forward. It's like, yeah, but there's give and take. Yes. And yes. You've been mauled, too. That's true. Like, if you, if you do make some gains, but you suffered twice as many losses, or you can't afford to replace your losses, or, you, and, yeah, it, it's, yeah. And the point you make that he doesn't know about his casualties bears out on the third day when he's setting up the line mm-hmm. and he's up there around the Tennessee Monument area riding around and saying, my God, is this all there is? Yeah. 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 Well, even knowing that, you can replace him, you know. You got other troops and he doesn't. So we know how that goes. My God. It, it, yeah. And he's um, commenting on the beauty of the Tennessee Monument, too. Just look at that. that. Is, Polished you know, marble. And then he talks about guts and borglum and compares <laughs> North Carolina to Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Wow, I hope yeah. when this is over, we can get over to Mount Rushmore and see that, too. Robert E. Lee, <laughs> monument critic. <laughs> All right, so back to, um, <laughs> back to the battle. So th- get them into the fight. Someone, anyone. I've been talking a lot. Go ahead. Go ahead. So as the battle's expanding with Longstreet's assault, they're hearing it. But like saying, from that view of not getting out of the car, they can't see everything clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke is shrouding the battlefield all along and just waiting for that opportunity. And about 5 p.m. or so is when Lang, at least, is going to start to get indication. I think that, like, your time's about here. Yeah. And the account, you know, one thing that you can always rely on to know about the Battle of Gettysburg is you will never know what time anything ever happened. <laughs> you can never keep track of that. They tell us any time between 5 and 7 p.m. is when they're going to start moving forward. Yeah. Probably more like 6 or 6.30. Yeah, I think but, closer to 6.30 because... Mississippi probably leaves around six. Yeah. And it's after that. And the other thing with that, there's no daylight savings time. There's all this smoke and it's getting, you know, we're heading toward dusk pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And that's just going to play into you can't see anything. Yeah, and there's one Floridian who I'd like to read kind of what he wrote down here real quick, describing this moment right before he goes out. He's talking about the tension as stuff's going up. He says, we caught the roar of the cannon and the rattle of musketry coming nearer and nearer. And we soon see brigade after brigade going in to charge the enemy's line of defenses. Men who had been playing cards immediately tore them up and threw them away. Yes. Like, Here comes the moment. Like, yeah. it's our time. Yeah. It's getting closer all along now. And, and for people who uh, hear that detail and go, well, why would they tear them up and throw them away? Oh, you would not want your mother to know you played cards. You're going to hell if you were a card player. <laughs> there you go. Smoking cigarettes, using foul language. <laughs> you are going to hell. No son of, of mine. Probably <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, all right. Now they're in the fight. They're in the fight. Describe the fight. What happens to them in the fight? Go ahead, Kev. 
So Wilcox starts moving forward, and as the Floridians are watching, they says they disappear into smoke, and you just hear the piercing scream of the rebel yell rising. Like, there they go. You know, here it goes. The sound of musketry cannons roll on all sides, and Lang now knows it's go time. Mm-hmm. It's my chance to join the fight. His skirmishers pushing forward. He's being met by skirmishers on the other one. And this is where kind of we're talking about that view comes into play with the different hills. He's talking about because just from where we're positioning him, loosely the Henry Spangler farm area, you got that view eventually up to the Emmitsburg Road. And for most of us, it looks like just kind of one view if you can get that angle. But he's describing two very distinct hills, Emmitsburg yeah. Road being that second right. hill. So step one, you got to take that first hill where there's these federal skirmishers who are anyway got to start pushing them back. And this is where the craziness begins with those skirmishers. It is an interesting perspective from the farm because it's it's you don't recognize it as Gettysburg because you can't see a lot of the recognizable things. If I recall, you can't see uh, the Pennsylvania Monument. You can't see anything. Can't of course, anything. it wasn't there at the time. Even no. for a while, a little round top disappeared. I was going to say, I don't there. think you could see the round tops. Yeah, right? So that's the trade-off is not only can the Floridians or others there not see what's in front of them, that also applies to the remainder of the federal army. Yeah. They can't see visually <laughs> yeah. what's going on back that's there. That's right. It's a good point. Side lines work both ways. And they do yeah. have skirmishers out though, right? As they're yeah. advancing? Yep. Yeah. These forward lines. Okay. Trying to make sure that you don't stumble into something by accident. Yeah. Uh, all right. Continue, Lewis. So they're going to uh, slowly push back these skirmishers, uh, the Floridians are, and they are going to approach um, the Emmitsburg Road. And that's where Humphrey's division has been posted, um, part of Sickles Corps. And they're just going to get into, they talk about getting really close. Um, I've read it in counts like 50 yards. I don't know if that's just one soldier uh, over embellishing things, but they're going to get close and start exchanging fire. The Floridians are going to start having people drop. They're going to ex- start experiencing a lot of um, a lot of casualties right off. But what they're going to do is they're going to start pushing back Humphreys because Humphreys is under pressure on his left because of uh, Wilcox's brigade. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to unhinge that line, and they're going to start falling back. The Floridians then are going to overrun some cannon that is going to be there and that the, the Federals haven't been able to um, get their, their horses, uh, their cannon mounted up and gotten out of the way. So they're going to start overrunning some cannon, specifically Weir's battery. And that has moved from south from the Kadori farm. But as they come up, even Thomas's battery is up on Cemetery Ridge, and they're just going to lay into... Um, the Floridians. They're going to take a lot of fire um, because by now the, 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 the infantry, the federal infantry has moved out of the way. They're just going to take, they're going to get decimated by this uh, this battery up there on Cemetery Ridge, which interesting, we talk, go back to when they're coming across, as you go up these hills and stuff, when you first, when you walk their path, when you first see the Emmitsburg Road, you still can't see Seminary, or Cemetery Ridge. So it's not like you come up the hill and it's all open. You can only see as far as the road. Mm. And then you go down again mm. and you come up. It's when you're coming up to the, the road, that's when you see the ridge itself up there. So it takes a while for them to see all this other the points east uh, that they're going to confront. For Perry's men, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So, and we'll see that you know again when we do our tour. But you just, it, it's not like they come up on this hill, oh, there's the road and there's this ridge behind it. Mm-hmm. It's the road and you can't see beyond it. Yeah. And you got to go further. So, um, if you're if you've got the Lena book and you're reading along with us, like we're in two sixty two page. Where are you? Yeah, I'm two sixty. Two sixty, two sixty two, somewhere yeah, in there. Two sixty is where it starts, right? Yeah, yeah. With this guy. All right. So just to give people an idea. So, um, and and when you're talking about the battery, so Weir's battery was at the Kodori farm, and they were moved south into that area. They're moved. They're, Southeast, more so, or less, yeah, to right. get out of the way, because because um, the Confederates are Wright's, pretty close to the Kadori. Wright's farm. brigade is coming on. Yeah, um, so he's trying to get him out of the way. He's gonna Weir is gonna leave the field, and he's gonna leave three of his cannons on the field, and the Floridians are gonna get there. I say capture with quotes because they don't pull them off the field. Right. right. Um, so, you know, you occupied that space for a little bit, but you didn't actually capture the cannon. Now, on the Union side. Barksdale is charging through there. Hancock rides down. He gets the first Minnesota to go in against them, try to stem the tide. Um, Willard's brigade is going to move from the Ziegler's um, farm or um, Ziegler's Grove area down south, and he's going to throw them in to try to stop Wilcox. He's going to move. The the 19th Maine is going to come down, 
and they're going to be the ones, the primary Union infantry that's going to be blocking the Floridians as they're coming across. Um, anything to add to that? I just want to add into the context of what you're saying that talk about how they pierce through that line to begin with and what's going to lead to that pandemonium is you've got along that Emmitsburg and you've got Barksdale crashing and you've got Wilcox crashing and simultaneously with the Floridians. But then you've also got this issue with the first Massachusetts out there who is going out deployed as this line of skirmishers. And as they're falling back, Carge, uh, the brigadier general, the, the brigade commander, excuse me, is going to be watching these skirmishers fall back onto his line in the road. And I think this is how we get to that point where Weir and others are so surprised. Because when the Floridians are advancing on him, he thinks it's his skirmishers falling back. So he's telling his units not to open fire you know, mm. there. And then by the time it's clear, like, these aren't our buddies. It's these Floridians open fire on them, pouring it in. That causes that break and then the collapse and the withdrawal to yeah. begin to where I think Weir and others would have thought they had more time than they do. Because you got a little bit of a blunder. Yeah. You know, stumbles yeah. in in the course of in this process and allows the Floridians to spill over the road. Then where they attempt to see that line reforming and then you just open volleys on it again. It's fully withdrawn. And now Weir's like, oh, I'm the front line, basically. Everybody else is streaming past me. Right. OK. And all that Confederate pressure. And, and you know, it's like a dam. You break one little spot on it. Everywhere else is going to start to cave in with time. And now you got what's left to laying. You got sure. Wilcox still searching. You got Barksdale doing his thing. And eventually we're going to have Wright joining on the side. You need everything you can get. First Minnesota. You need Willard. You need the. Yeah, uh, and this, the main. Is, this is the spot, I think, in the big picture. If there had been more active Confederate leadership at the division command, especially when Pender goes down, nobody really takes over. Um, and it really peters out that end of the field. But they're getting there. They've crossed the Emmitsburg Road. Right is coming on. To Wright's left, Posey's men are supposed to come up. And only one regiment really comes up to 48th Mississippi. Um but Wright will complain afterwards, and we did that tour last year where they get up there to the line, and he says they see the whole – maybe it was two years ago. I'm losing track. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was two years ago, yeah. the last one, because uh, Bo Brinkman. Wright's brigade. Yeah. 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 And he sees the whole federal army. Um, he complains afterwards that he doesn't have support on his left or his right. Well, he did have support on the right. It's, it's Lang's Floridians. But they've been driven back. They're starting to fall back by the time Wright is busting through. Right. He doesn't have the support he needs on his left. But um, it is on his right. It's just that they've gotten to the furthest point they're going to get. And they just that artillery and stuff lays into them. 19th Maine is out there laying into them. They, they're spent. It's a, again, it's only about 700 soldiers to begin with. Yeah. They're not big. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not like you got this this big force on your right to help you out. But the timing is a little bit off, I yeah. think. Um, those two brigades, Wright and Lang, needed to move forward almost together because of the size of Lang's brigade. It's just not the big force it needed to be. So, And it's but, ironic, given one of the survivors of the Florida brigade is going to be saying that what we needed to ultimately carry the day was two or three more brigades yeah. to come in <laughs> on the side of Wright. And then, you know, we continue down the battle line past Wright, and you got, you know, Posey getting tangled up along right. those farms. You got Mahone just, like, chilling or whatever he's doing. <laughs> Being you Mahone. Know, Although, he, hanging Mahone until, like, develops. He gets a, his career goes up from here. He, sure. he does a decent job in 1864. Um, excuse me. Um, well, again, if Anderson can step in yeah. in those moments, you might potentially have two more brigades, or at least the better portion of two brigades that you could thrust in, not even including Pender. Yeah, Anderson is yeah. not actively engaged in this fight. Dorsey Pender goes down. Um, and I said this before on a tour, and this is just me, Lewis Trott, uh, giving you an opinion. I think it, the hinge point is the Bliss Farm. Because yeah. Posey gets tangled up in the Bliss Farm, and you got to bypass that thing. They should have burned it. You know, I don't want the guy's farm to be burned, <laughs> but burn it down the first day, or this, you know, first day you're there. This yeah, yeah the minute battle. it becomes an issue, yeah, burn it burn down. It down. Yeah, but, and you know, they wait till the third day, and the Union Army burns it down. But it, like I said, <laughs> only one regiment of Mississippians moves out of that area, the 48th Mississippi, to join in on um, the left of right. And it's just not enough, but. Yeah, we've lost all that momentum. Yeah. We've lost all the speed. So then you've got Wright basically guaranteed with his left flank is going to be wide open. And then Lang, never big to begin with, struggling with the issues he has, is going to be eventually be pulling back, just leaving Wright totally bent. There's just not enough people moving forward. And whether that was the original plan or not is another thing. Yeah. And in the big yeah. picture, things start petering out on that line. When things broke loose behind Hancock over on Culp's Hill, he's able to send Carroll's brigade over there to help out. 
because yeah, right. things have stabilized at that end of his line. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Confederate attacking everywhere behind you, you look and increasingly to your side, you're not seeing any support back there. But what you're three, seeing through the smoke and the chaos in front of you, there just seems to be these endless pouring amounts of federal reinforcement, even if it is just, you know, a couple hundred guys. Right. So and like you don't have the content. This ain't a video game. Exactly. You can't hit the pause button and go 30,000 feet and see where everybody is on a map. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like you just see, OK, if they're only. advancing. Ain't no 200 plus guys who's going to be advancing into that on their own. Right. And this is the reinforcements like batteries lumbering in at full speed here. Like we in big trouble and we got no help. They're getting thousands rolling in. Even if we know as students of the battle, that's not what's that's happening. That's not what it is. They, right. At the, yeah. at the time, they don't know. Yeah. You have a split second to make life and death decisions. Yeah. And in that split second, are you, how much how much are you going to roll the dice? Yeah. And point. how much can happen to you while you're taking that split second to right. decide? Say, so let me just not load my gun for a second. Let me just kind of take in this. <laughs> you know, see what's going on. Check, you know, check my flanks. Look behind me. It's like, oh, that's climb a up on a buddy's shoulders. Yeah. And see how, like, oh, I like what they did with the dying. shutters on that house. I'll have to take a picture for my wife. Show her what we could do to ours. Every second out here is crazy, is chaotic, is smoke filled, is disorienting. Yeah. The heart is beating out of your chest. Probably, you're just tasting gunpowder. Everyone, mm. nobody is thinking at the absolute tip of what you know. Any of us sitting here in this room, you know, comfortably, who think thinking as we're sitting at home, like it's really easy to jump on people's yeah, backs. Sure, and you know, um, none of us have bullets flying at us. Right no, now. we don't. So all okay, right, so then what happens? Does uh, does Lang get surrounded, or do they attempt to surround him? Or they don't. Um, they don't get surrounded because Wright's brigade does come up and goes further than them. So it's just a matter of they take so many frontal, so much frontal fire that it decimates them, and they yeah. realize yeah, we're not going to make it. And yeah, and then you mentioned Weir, but also you mentioned Thomas, um, not too far away, firing basically into their faces. Yeah, um, and by and then it's canister, <laughs> right? Yeah. Double exactly, canister. right? Yeah, and we're talking batteries here, folks. And uh, so, yeah, so they're, they're uh, not in a good position. So they, they're going to, I'm, I'm assuming, fall back, right? Or do they say, yeah, eff it and charge? So he's going to fall back eventually, <laughs> okay? Because uh, Lang's going to get a report while Wright's still advancing. He gets a report that something's happening on his right side. I know it's confusing reason right and right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. W-R-I-G-H-T is on his left and Wilcox is on his right. It says Wilcox, he gets a report, has fallen back. And there's a heavy force of federal troops moving around to Lang's right. So Lang's like, ooh, this ain't good. So in this case, he does go check it out. And then over there and he sees this line of federal soldiers that are, at least, I think he says like 100 yards. They've yeah. advanced around me and they're trying to cut me off. Or at least he believes, given the viewpoint and all stuff that if we don't leave now we're going to get cut off real fast mm -hmm. and the only responsible choice in spite of the fact that you know we're right at the base of you know this mountain is gonna say like we're right there we've almost broken through like boys we got to go we yeah. got to go now and in so doing is going to kind of be leaving right out there a little bit but he's doing right by his men i think right's, right's doing, doing right, right. by his <laughs> lang is doing right by his men lang's doing right by his While men right does his stuff <laughs> with wilcox to the right but to the left is real right <laughs> whatever <laughs> and you noticed it when they write when they when they write w r i t -E. i can't spell i hate this um, episode yeah <laughs> a lot of writing writing going on uh they always write about these mountains this would be like the Appalachian, this would be an extension of the Appalachian Mountains if there were this many mountains yeah. that they actually say. Because Wright says he gets up there and there's a mountain. Yeah. We'd have a lot more mountains. What the hell is he talking Little about? Little round top wouldn't be anything because we'd go to these other mountains for the <laughs> <Yeah>. view. <laughs> I mean, I guess if people are shooting at you and you're walking over that rough ground um, with fences and other obstacles and, and, you know, again, the bullets and shells and all that, I guess a, a small rise might feel like a mountain it but probably their experience makes everything bigger than it actually was right. as far as terrain and stuff and the toughness to get there and so it's just uh, a little bit of um <gasps> inflating things afterwards when you're writing about them well and i wonder because they're probably not seeing oh unquestionably they're not seeing as clearly as we would see it either so you're seeing this rise in the ground going up and just, you know, the smoke sort of thing. So you're probably filling in some gaps that might yeah. not be there even further yeah. exaggerating what's inside of that smoke. And, and, and maybe, too, that they never envisioned that people would want to come back and visit these places. Because be. I don't know. I, I've, I've, I've been meaning to find out the answer to this, if anybody knows. Like, how big in, in the mind of a 19th century American, how common was memorializing battlegrounds. Like, was that a thing, or is that a thing that came out of the Civil War for us? I mean, I know there might be, you know, there's always been monumentation, 
but to preserve ground that a battle or a historic event was fought on. Was that a big thing p- prior to the Civil War, at least in the United States? I think it depends. Like, uh, Lewis, you were the there. Old, I mean, you would. Yeah. <laughs> and we were big on the old North Bridge. I mean, that was everything. That was, that was Mecca. <laughs> and we'd stop by Luis May Alcott's house there. At, uh, <laughs> the old North Bridge. The orchard. And uh, we'd have lunch. And we'd go on down to the North Bridge. And we'd go down there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Picnicking by the creek. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was nice. So, uh, I think. The monumentation, you know, expanded clearly with after the Civil War. But you know, you think about Batchelder; he starts writing people in yeah. 1863 but, still, but, the latter part of 1863 about this battle. Yeah, so it's already started. But that makes me wonder: was he a visionary who, for, like, created what we have now, or was that already a thing back then? I'm trying to think of of battlefields prior to the Civil War. I mean, did they did they preserve any of the 1812 battlefields, or was the country so young and still fragile enough where they're like, we don't have time to be looking back. We've got to be looking ahead. We've got to build and stabilize the country, and we've got some issues that we need to work out from the founding. And it was just they weren't thinking that way. Yeah, without did, without looking anything up, I can think of two places they probably Yorktown, because that's when Cornwallis gets defeated. Okay, and then. The area of the old North Bridge when the, the revolution, you know, the shot heard around the world right. and stuff. Other than that. I say there's a monument on Bunker Hill, isn't there? There is. There is. No, exactly. But that was. Uh, that. that later. Yeah, I've been up in that thing. It's you're going like this around the. Oh, yeah. Because no, no, the stairwell is really tiny. But it's neat when you get up there. Nice view of Boston. 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 You can see some cars from up there. <laughs> Pick Pack. out a bar you're going to go to later in the evening. Park down in Harvard Yard. Yeah. No farther than Harvard Yard. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. So, yeah, aside from those handful of places, I don't think there's any, there's enough places to really get into it. So, it's interesting that Batchelder says, this is it. He wasn't here. You know, for some reason, he quit traveling with the army, but this is, he knows this is his Xanadu, and he's not going to get a painting out of it, but he starts writing before the end of 1863 to participants. So, he at least knew this was a big deal. You know, the Union soldiers, I'm sure, knew it was a big deal because it's the first time really on their proper northern soil that they fended off Lee. Um, so That was nice how you threw in a tribute to the late Olivia Newton-John in there as well. Did uh, I? Is that a do? Oh, yeah. I was thinking of uh, Charles Foster. Yeah, Payne. no, I know. It Rosebud. Rosebud. Right? Don't just say it. Rosebud. Rosebud. There you go. <laughs> Charles Foster Kane. Rosebud. It's kind of an overrated movie. Um, I, you know, I don't remember the story of it, but uh, cinematographically, I think it was nice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, very I forget the night guy's innovative. name. Todd somebody, but he was the shadows and all that. Yeah. That's what's big about it. Yeah. yeah but the story itself. Nah, it's about Hearst. Who cares? Yeah, Hearst had his own big building, too. Up. Uh, San San Marta Disco in California or somewhere. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. He had a big castle. That's what it's based off of. Anyway, we, we talk. Yeah, uh, we, 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 <laughs> we go way off the beaten path. How does July second end for Perry's Brigade? Well, it was dark. Down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 ah, ah, what a crowd! What a crowd! No, really, what happens to them? Do they stay out on the Emmitsburg Road or do they go back a bit? No, so they withdraw back. And to help orient us, especially when we're talking about the mountains and things, think of like roughly, see if you agree with this, like where the Hancock M- Wounding Memorial is, more or less in that, str- yeah, as that as being part of that mountain. Yeah, the yeah. The general area where the Floridians are going to be striking. So pulling back from there, Lang's like, all right, I'm going to bail, and I got to bail out. So it goes back to the Emmitsburg Road, I'm going to hold this position, quickly realizes why it was so easy comparatively to drive the other guys out of the road, like, we can't stay here. They go all the way back to where they started. And you just basically start preparing to go back to sleep. Send some skirmishers out, but you're sleeping in the exact same place where a few hours before there were basically twice as many of you. Right. And now you're right there, and I'm sure you're feeling a lot of holes in the line. Do we know how many casualties they took on July 2nd? There's number estimates, but they're all over the place. But nobody on really has. Between 40 to 50 percent. Yeah, because at the, the end of two days, it's about 450. Yeah. Out of 700. Yeah. So. Yeah. Lang reports 455. I think there's, you know, as with anything, like yeah, times yeah. and stuff, numbers are... The uh, yeah, four fifty five. Uh, uh, I think the Godfrey's says book here, something like that. So. Yeah, Godfrey has it. It's a strength of seven forty two and losses of four fifty five, sixty one percent. Yeah, 
Uh, okay, so July the July second is not their only uh, day, though. That's the thing. We have the July third, yeah, day of fighting. So what happens with uh, Perry's brigade on July third? And and this is when you have the ambiguous uh, orders that we previously referenced. When Lang is told, he's not told anything to do specifically other than get with Wright, or uh, excuse me, Cadmus Wilcox, who's going to be on his right. Uh, let's leave Ambrose Wright behind. We're not going to talk about him for t- 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 the third. So it's Wilcox and Lang. Um, Lang is on the left of Wilcox, and he's going to tell him, uh, Anderson is going to tell Lang, Wilcox has your orders. Do what he says. Because by now, they are, they're such a small unit. It's hardly a brigade. You can we, We'll call it a brigade. That's how we know them. But it's not a brigade. It's, it's like a large regiment. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. When so, they come in, they're smaller at the start than like a 26th North yeah. Carolina is. Yeah. Like, yeah. A full brigade. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So he's he's basically attached to Cadmus Wilcox Alabamians. Um, and you're under his control now. So you follow what they do. And, you know, what direction he gets from Wilcox is sort of vague to me anyways. Um but they are told when Pickett goes in, you go in on the right. You know, the, the way I read it, they're supposed to go past them, Pickett's men on their left. Once they go in, you go in on their right and you take advantage of whatever success Pickett has had. What throws them off is Pickett's division has been told to close the gap with Pettigrew, Pettigrew and Trimble's brigades. So they're going to have to oblique to their left to close this gap. It's Archer's brigade under uh, Fry on the far right of Pettigrew and Trimble. And then you have Garnett on the far left of um, Pickett's men. But there's a gap between these two forces. The plan is to close the gap by the time you get to the point on Cemetery Ridge. To do that, Pickett's men are going to have to oblique to the left which takes them away from Lang's Floridians and Cadmus Wilcox's brigade. So another this other gap develops between these two forces, Pickett and Lang and Wilcox. So regardless of what Wilcox has been told to do, follow in on their right and exploit whatever, it all goes haywire because Wilcox doesn't realize that Pickett's going to have to oblique to the left, away from his force. Sound about good? Yeah. There you go. Spot I'll on. let you uh, carry on from there. Yeah, because when he gets those orders laying in Wilcox, according to Wilcox's account at least, that he goes up and he has a conversation with Wilcox and it's kind of like, okay, I think we're about to be going forward again. I was saying, it says, if we're ordered to do basically the same thing, like, what are you going to do? And Wilcox is saying, oh, well, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Says, but what if it's absolutely imperative? What if you have to do it? Right. Well, then as a soldier, I will obey my orders <clears throat> and I will do it under protest. <laughs> and so, at least according to what Lang is telling us, he's got this understanding from the guy who's now in charge of him, more or less, that we're not really going to do this with any alacrity if we even comes to that at all. So I think when the time comes, I think Lang's a little bit surprised hmm. at that movement because going forward, you're going to be this support, maybe, you know, swinging in in some way, shape or form. But the one thing that is clear is they do not have a full, they do not even have a remotely clear understanding of what is happening with the main infantry assault. Yeah. And remembering again, the views, same things that applied on the second applies on the third as Kemper and others is passing over them marching when it likely begins those obliques. It's very plausible that neither Lang or Wilcox can see that, even if yeah. it was a clear field. Sure. So you don't know until you yourself get that time to move forward. And what they can see as that charge is underway, though, is stragglers, wounded, others. Yeah. Starting to thread back. Like, yeah, I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> it's all this yesterday. It look like a good idea going in. Uh, so, uh, all right. So then what happens next? So Wilcox is going to get their. So, according to so supposedly. Uh, uh, what is it? Longstreet is having this conversation with Fremantle. You know, so, oh, I wouldn't miss this for the world, General. And like, oh, you know, I would. See, the charge is already over. It's been repulsed. You know, tells one of his aides, you know, go tell General Pickett what I've just said, that the charge has basically been defeated. Oh, but by the way, while you're doing that, tell him if he wants to, he can send Wilcox in. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Yeah. So the aide goes over. Pickett is going to send three aides to go find Wilcox because he doesn't think all three of them are going to survive. Uh-huh. You know, one of these three guys is going to make it. So I imagine, you know, aide one is telling Wilcox, you know, form up, move forward, you know. Aid two, form up, move forward. By the time this third aide gets there with the message, Wilcox saying, I know, I know, like I'm going. Lang, meanwhile, a little bit confused. He says the first thing he hears is, 
uh, Wilcox is saying, you know, attention forward. And this was like, oh, crap, you know, we got to get up. You know, we're all going forward now. But we don't understand why. Right. Because as far as he is concerned, the charge is already over based on what he's seeing. Yeah. He says Pickett had been fully repulsed. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe it's just, you know, again, the wounded and stragglers that are drifting back on that he thinks it's over. But again, they're moving forward and they don't know where they're moving forward. That's insane. And even Lang wouldn't have had the full kind of administrative control yeah, to manipulate that, right. even if he had. But you step up over, you're going through, you know, Porter Alexander's guns and everything. And there's some there's some pretty awful descriptions yeah. from some of these soldiers, from Porter and other, excuse me, Alexander and others watching this time about these men are saying, like, what the devil are we doing right now? He just sees the sad faces on the men. Like, why are we moving forward now? If we were small yesterday, we're even smaller now. And what Anderson's whole division couldn't do yesterday, what's this much smaller group going to be able to do today when there's a reinforced enemy over that's already been pressed by a force that's maybe 10 times or so our own strength? And they just follow the smoke in the complete wrong direction, as we know. It is, uh, it is sad. It's a waste of those lives that were lost in that particular I mean really the whole thing is but um, you know in that movement because what was it all for you know they're charging over the same ground twice yeah and what I think is even more disheartening about that is remembering yesterday's action on the second as these men are now re-advancing you know they're marching over buddies I was just so going to say, yep, out there. yes. Yeah. Some of whom, you know, not all of whom have passed. I'm probably clawing at pant legs or things. Yeah. You know, if it's your friend down there, I don't know of any counts oh, this, but unquestionably that has to happen. Somebody asking for some water, like, you know, you know, help me out. Yeah, you know, sure. From your company, you know, like that just, and you're going into that now where there's not much of a broader Confederate force still fighting over to your left. So their dear friend, Uncle McGilvery out there is just going to be slammering them. <laughs> with everything else. Like there's only these like 12, 1400 guys more or less. Yeah. And like it's just, these guys. You, you know, you can talk about whether Pickett's charge is going to uh, fail or succeed. It doesn't matter. But there's a purpose to it. Yeah. We want to get there, punch a hole in the line, hang a left, go get that hill. All right. So there is this purpose. Uh, Wilcox and Lang's movement forward seems to be purposeless. It, there is no purpose for it. They're not going to accomplish anything good. It's just a waste of life. Right. And it's just, that's the... And they're not even going in behind like, Pickett. They're uh, going into the right of Pickett. So it's like... After Pickett's men are coming back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Out of all the movements... But 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 what I'm saying is... Days, well, but th- th- that they're not told to be ready to support Pickett from behind him, not to the right, because what's to the right of Pickett's uh, division... Uh, like we don't know because we can't see it. We don't know what's out there, and and we're going to attack that. But who's going to back us up? At least if Pickett pokes a hole in the line, we can back him up. Yeah, right. But that's not what they do. So it's an even bigger waste. Is yeah. you're, you're going off to the right. Well, what's at the right? It's so tragic. It and is I, tragic. I think out yeah. of all three days, this one little event is probably the the most purposeless event of units moving, getting destroyed. With no purpose in mind. Yeah. Really. Yeah, because you can compare it to something like similar scenes of madness, like sometimes like South Calvary action or things. You can see they're trying to do something. Right, but you can see if, even if it's got like a 1% chance of success, if that somehow pans together, like there's a little bit of logic in that, even though most of us would see it's pretty jacked up. (laughs) Occasionally, yeah, what are these guys going to do in the best case scenario other than maybe just maybe? Just Longstreet being like, all right, Lee told me to make all these orders, send these units in, so I'm just fulfilling that order. Yeah. And sending the last kind of wave, if you want to use that. Yeah, and that's what it kind of seems like, is Lee's like, yeah, we're going to go do this. Go do it, boys. And then Longstreet or whoever follows the order, carries it out, and it's just slaughter for no discernible purpose. They don't have any artillery support. They've got McGilvery in front of them. By now, Pickett's men are falling back, so the 16th Vermont leaves them and directs their attention to Lang's left flank. Yeah. And so they're taking fire from Standard's men. Um, and there's just, there's absolutely 0% hope yeah. from I the w- get-go. I wonder what those Vermonters are thinking in that moment. You know, they're wrapping up prisoners and things of Pickett's, and then they must have just, like, turned around see these guys <laughs> lumbering over the hill. Yeah. Two for one like, sale. <laughs> <laughs> what what is special, this? boys? <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder, too, if there's kind of that moment of, like, where they maybe felt sorry for them. I bet they do. I guess like, I bet they shoot. I know what we got to do, but like, you guys got no chance. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just pivot right around. You're going to get hammered by literally everybody. Everybody. You're going to get all that artillery on you. And the average soldier again, you know, just right, left, right, left. You're plowing forward and suddenly those shoulders next to you give way. 
<sighs> gaps in the line popping everywhere. Yeah. You're just venturing forward and you're like, didn't we just do this yesterday? Right. 24 hours ago we did this, except there were twice as many of us, yeah. more or less. Right. And yeah. we're the only ones that remember how stupid it was, but the people ordering it uh, clearly uh, didn't get that memo, that yeah. it was a stupid move. And a lot of them, too, remembering the ground, they wouldn't have necessarily been able to see possibly that point of forward advance, at least regularly viewed, yeah. unless they're moving significantly yeah. forward. Yeah. That we're just, you know, we are soldiers, we obey, we follow the orders, but... But, but you're still human beings, and you must feel, you know, the futility of, of that and feel like... Your leaders just think your life is completely worthless. I mean, that's got to weigh on you somehow, yeah. I would imagine. Morale is so much yeah. yeah, of what these soldiers are having. And I can't imagine there's much of anything left. No. Um, and what is left of them when, when it's all said and done? Do you mention the Vermonters coming out and after they flank Kemper and they're wrapping that up? They go and flank uh, Perry's men. Yeah. And then how does that end? Oh, they're trying to get out of there by this point. They're trying to fall back. You know? Now, is it an even or uh, an organized uh, falling back or retreat, or do they just like no, see they, guys on the other side? Because they scattered out of desperation. Yeah. They yeah. get in that area, like the Kadori Trussell thicket. Lang even says, like, his men scattered out amongst the bushes and the rocks. Like, yeah. You're taking fire from every direction. Jeez. And you are pinned down. You got Vermont coming in on your side. You got McGilvery and all these units pouring into your front. In this case, you don't have Ambrose right on your left today. You don't have anybody covering you on any flank. It is just you all. And so when Lang, or excuse me, when Wilcox and Lang are ultimately going to begin withdrawing, because they that, we don't, we can't get the message to everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially those guys on the left, which are Floridians in this unit, they are being savaged over there. Massive amounts of prisoners going to be taken. They're going to lose their flag. Like they lose two flags. Two flags. Uh, yeah. out of out of the the, the two days of fight. Yeah, they and the other one gets ripped from the uh, that one barely survived. Yeah, <laughs> from the guide on um, the pole. I used to call it a guide on. Yeah, they almost kind of sixteenth main it there for a second. Yeah, and I think they lose the <laughs> second and the eighth flag and the fifth one. You're on the verge of losing. And that guy what rips it down and yeah. shoves it in his shirt right there and try to. That's run right. Off yeah, they end. lose their colors with the, the. I'm sorry, I was looking through the book. You're talking about the second. Is it the second? Yeah, I lost back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get to July 3rd's map. What page are you on, Lewis? I'm on uh, 359. 359. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Keep going. Yeah, the second and the eighth are going to lose their flags, as you yeah. say, not necessarily on the same day. But that then goes into when you look at this thing in hindsight, you have two out of the three flags of this brigade taken, which is, you know, one of the ultimate embarrassments, you know, all yeah. those sorts of, and that third one barely survives. Ripped from the pole. Dude, is, yeah, yeah, rips it from the pole, and, you know, the Federals can capture the pole, but I guess you, yeah. it's not. Somebody did, too. They yeah. picked it up. You got this guy running back oh, to the flag. so close to a medal of honor. Yeah. All I got is a stick. That's why I love the other guy who picks up the flag on the day before. <laughs> yeah. Thomas Horan, I think it, his name is. He just picks it up off yeah. the ground and conspicuous and he, It wasn't his <laughs> unit that stops him. He's, yeah. he's coming out the second wave and just sees it laying there, and he, hey, look what I found. <laughs> and one of those Lucky flags, me. I think it's the flag of the eighth. I might be wrong on this. Maybe it's, I think it's the flag of the eighth. Now, this was, like, super important to them, the one they're going to lose, because this was presented to them at Fredericksburg during the battle. You know, the artillery and things is booming all around. Sometimes they're ordered to form up and kind of receive this flag in this moment here, you know, with the starburst yeah. design and things like I mean, well, we know flags always are super important and have sure. a profound meaning. This one that's, like, directly connected with during combat, they yeah. are receiving this, and now, oh, in what is this almost defying definition suicidal attack, they're going to lose even that one. Yeah. Coming home from Tallahassee. This is rough. They're streaming back. They get them back eight, late 1800s, I think, sometime. They, oh, really? They're, they're sent back to Tallahassee, yeah. So they got them back eventually. They should have kept it. Is it, what is it, Minnesota still that got kept it, uh, Virginia? Yeah, somebody. Yeah. They should, yeah, they should have kept it. They should ask for it back. They Fairly wanted, won. They wanted season tickets to Disney World. Uh, that's a good, <laughs> that's a fair trade, because that's, it's an expensive place. <laughs> that it is. Uh, all right, so they end with, uh, what, was, what did we say before, 61% uh, casualties. They've got, prior rank, just a rough guess, 250 men left. Yeah, something is like that, that. Yeah, yeah. 250 men out of, uh, well, About we can do the math. Hold on. Let's let's do the math here. Everybody get your calculators nah, out. Nah, you lost uh -oh. me. 742 okay. minus 455. There's no math section. I don't, I don't really know. I'm a history major. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, 80 killed, 228 wounded, 147 missing. That's how that breaks down. And maybe somebody in the audience could do the math. And uh, what we'll do is take a break. Uh, come back with questions from our audience. Um, uh, of course, they send the questions in earlier, so I doubt anybody did the math for us in the question section. Uh, but we'll maybe we'll maybe we'll figure it out during the break. Who knows? We'll uh, be right back after these words. 
Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. Our favorite bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. Isn't it, Eric? You're darn tootin', Matt. (laughs) It's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used. And online, they have even more books to choose from. But Matthew, what if the Civil War is simply not my thing? Not a problem, my fine four-fendered friend. This is for the historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how they squeeze thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more into their store. And it's also astounding how you and I both squeeze into our pants every day. (laughs) (laughs) Well, handsome, they have a warehouse, too, and that's where they keep all those books that are available online at ForTheHistorian.com. And folks, if you go to ForTheHistorian.com now and order books until you're blooming the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund your shipping costs. What if I prefer to browse in the store and don't want to go online to get my book? Great question, Doodlebug. Just mention Addressing Gettysburg at checkout, and they'll take 20% off the retail price of your item. So go to ForTheHistorian.com, stop by 42 York Street, or call 717 685 That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. If you're a lover of history, then go to TRHistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of interests from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers gift cards and a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use promo code GBERG1863. So go to trhistorical.com, TR Historical, for the love of history. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio, it's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached 1 million downloads and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. 
That's sales at addressinggettysburg.com. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. All right, and we are back with uh, Lewis Trott and Kevin Bryant talking about the Florida Brigade. Uh, Kevin, remind me, next time I have you on the show, I should have a helium tank in here that I require you uh, you use before you speak. I'll make sure to remind you. <laughs> See, that's, that's good. You sound like Herbert on Family Guy there. <laughs> hey, come here, muscly arms. <laughs> you thick, creamy thighs. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, so you know, uh, if you uh, if you have questions and you want them to be a part of and ask a guide, uh, you need to become a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. All patrons, all levels of patrons uh, get to ask the questions. But uh, the the ones at the uh, what is it second lieutenant level I think is the most value there. You get uh, all of the episodes that we put out, uh, and plus a couple of other things every once in a while there. Um, so yeah, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. All right, we're going to start off with Brian Derenick, and he says, "Can your guests talk about the controversy and criticism that Ambrose Wright had?" Uh, caused towards the lack of support on his brigade's right from Perry's brigade during the attack on Cemetery Ridge on the evening of July 2nd, including the refuting of Wright's claims by Colonel Lang and Adjutant James B. Johnson immediately following the battle. Kevin, you're new here. I'm going to let you go first. Yeah, so at, almost as soon as the battle is over, Ambrose Wright is going to begin issuing these statements and some of these reports and letters that Floridians did not go that far forward. That they were the first to fall back. He's going to be pressed on some of these issues. Say, well, they went to the Emmitsburg Road. They didn't go any further. Basically, Ambrose Wright is just slamming Lang's Floridians all along, saying they're the reason we failed. Look how far I made it. And then I found myself exposed on both flanks because Florida left me hanging. Uh -huh. That's the first version of at least this series of attacks that makes its way into a lot of the media. The time it's picked up in newspapers all across the South that the Floridians didn't go forward far enough. The Alabamians did, the Georgians did, but Florida left them hanging, and therefore that hmm. is why Robert E. Lee's master plan completely collapsed. Florida always getting the blame, and he he goes further than that. He you know he blames Anderson for a lot of stuff, rightly so, I guess, to a point. But it, it it's such a big deal that Anderson wants to have him court martialed, mm -hmm. wants to have Wright court martialed. Really? So they have a you know this war is still going on. Uh, Sometime during, the, I think it's the fall of 63 that they have this proceeding and stuff. But um, back to the point, um, Lang, I think it's Lang who writes a letter that's published in the Richmond Inquirer refuting all this. I think it's July 26, maybe. Yeah. So, right, a few, few weeks afterwards, you know, we were there. You know, we mentioned it earlier. It's probably getting dark by the time all this is happening. And there's a lot of smoke on the field. He might not have seen them. They clearly don't go as far as Wright's brigade does. They don't get to the ridge, but um, there's a lot in front of them that's stopping them, too. It's not by they're right. trying. It's and, not like it's a wide-open yeah, plane and, for them. And, and Wright's just bitter. I mean, his, his men get there the way he sees it. There's no support. And it was, you know, and made that effort sort of useless that we got there. What's the use of getting there if we're not going to be able to hold it? He's just a bitter guy. Uh about the Floridians and Anderson, amongst other things. And so he's just venting. Um, you know, Wilcox does the same thing against Longstreet after all this. There's a lot of venting from all these people why we failed, other than saying, yeah, our, our big commander didn't do so well either. So, And it's, it's taking it even beyond. It's Wright is not just saying we went the furthest. You know, you see those kind of measuring contests. Yeah, you know, yeah. Who went the furthest. That isn't the issue. He's saying... Not only did I go further than the Floridians, the Floridians shamefully ran away. Like, you know, mm, yeah. they didn't even try to bring any honor to this field. So it's not just this question of I was slightly better than you. It's like you failed in every aspect yeah. of it. And Lang, going, especially remembering what we've been talking about, the tragedy involved in these moments, the level of loss that they've seen. Lang goes back to Anderson, the division commander, and is like, dude, like, <laughs> bail me out here. You know what he's saying is fundamentally wrong. Right, right. And Anderson's going to be issuing this statement about, you know, the gallantry of the Floridians and their advancing forward and like Lewis saying, you got that court martial coming down where this yeah. is going to be a part of that issue. Floridians are incensed right? because this is the version 
of the Battle of Gettysburg, at least on day two, that is making it back home, that they are among those who are responsible for the failure or for the defeat. Yeah. And yeah. They, they probably crossed the Emmitsburg Road first. So they're probably getting more fire from Cemetery Ridge before right Wrights before other people yeah. take it from them. Yeah. And so, you know, if if Cemetery Ridge is going to hold, they're going to fall back first because they're they've been engaged longer than Wright's brigade, and yeah. Wright it just lacks all context. Yeah. It's like him commenting on something that happened in Devil's Den. Oh, the Texans didn't do good enough down there, or they brought that loser Arkansas regiment with them, and that's why they lost. He doesn't see that. So he, I don't think he has context about what's going on around him. Other than on his left, there's nobody other than one regiment. That's clear. But with the darkness and the smoke and all that contributing to it, Floridians attack first before um, Wright's brigade crosses the road. Therefore, they're going to fall back first. Hmm. That's what he may see. But he doesn't see the entire context about what's happening. He's just bitter. He's just a bitter old guy just wanting to sling blame anywhere, but the Union Army beat you. Yeah. I mean, that's what it boils down <laughs> that, to. Yeah, it really does. They whipped your butt. Yeah. And he's going to be pressed on that front, right, as some of the guys, they're going to come back and get enough evidence and things from both the survivors, the veterans, Anderson. Wright's ultimately going to be like, yeah, you know, my bad guys. But it's a thing where it's like, you issue a retraction, sure, but like. Two percent of the people who saw the original thing. It's like in a court. It's like in a court thing when somebody says something, I object and strike it from the record. Well, everybody's heard heard it. it. Yeah, yeah. Stupidest thing in the world. The jury will ignore that testimony. Really? Yeah. How am I going to ignore that? But for for Lang to have to take time to write a letter to the Richmond Enquirer a few weeks later. I mean, when there's more pressing issues. I mean, that's just the Southern Army. And the Northern Army to a point also. But the Southern Army is a soap opera at times. They really are. Yeah. They all these personalities and yeah know, i i think today's military can be a soap opera too because you still got egos trying to move up the ladder on the heads of other people um but w- there's no there's no letter writing campaigns to newspapers and all this because we live in a different age but all this stuff's going on when you're trying to win a war yeah. that you're already on the back foot on you, you know you you started behind the eight ball to begin with because you don't have as much stuff your industries aren't there yeah um and to, to engage on all this, where this other, this other uh, brigade commander who's lost sixty percent of his men has to feel the need to sit down and write a letter yeah. to a Richmond paper, to defend paper. himself, yeah, and his men, yeah, yeah to, to defend the honor of his brigade. It's just shameless. It's terrible. <laughs> It is. And you would think in in their case there, with all those things that you listed, all the things going against them from the get-go, that you know the, the leadership of the Confederacy would set an example for everybody else and be like, you know, we're really up against it here. We need to band together to win, and then we can squabble. But and let's it, get together and win first. But they couldn't even do that. And Lee tries to, if you think back, where, yeah. is, where is Pickett's report? His official report. The first one supposedly gets rejected right. because he's blaming other people. And Lee says, we don't have time for that. Well, all these other people are doing what you just told Pickett. Mm-hmm. So you should have let that stand. We can at least you know, hear what Pickett had to say. Yeah, there seems to be that Lee is uh, inconsistent a lot when it comes to Gettysburg. Yeah. You know, but yeah. diarrhea and angina might do that to you. I don't know. Uh, Joseph Wingate says, who was Edward Perry? Where is he from? What was his occupation before the war? Did he survive the war? What did he do after the war? Same questions for David Lang. We already said where he's from. Massachusetts. Yeah. Went to Massachusetts. Europe. After the war, he lives a decent life. He becomes governor. Mm-hmm. Um, late 1880s, he's governor. In the 1880s. Governor, governor of Florida? Florida, yeah. yeah. Um, and then he dies shortly after... Uh, I think he did two terms as governor. Yeah. Uh, I think he died shortly after the second term. Okay. So, um, but he had a successful political life. He was a lawyer. Um, so he, he does well, you know. He gets wounded. He comes back to lead the brigade. He gets wounded uh, at the wilderness. So he gets wounded, you know, taken out of action again for a time. And I don't think he comes back after that. No, he doesn't. Um, some guy named uh, Finnegan takes over the brigade. And I'll let you talk about Lang, but before that, uh, one thing about Lang, Lang stays a colonel. Lang is never the official commander of the Florida Brigade. These people get promoted to Brigadier General over him for some reason. The hmm. last guy is um, Colonel Theodore Brevet, 
and I think he's the last Confederate soldier promoted to general in the war. It happens in late March um, of 65. And, and Lang, ironically, at a permanent rank. Lang is still around. So As a colonel. Not, yeah. Hasn't been promoted to general. No. He, he re, the, the war ends, he's still a colonel. Hmm. And I don't see where he ever does a bad job. He just, these other people keep... He probably didn't do all the right things like brown nose or whatever. I guess not. It's kind of sad if you ask me. It is kind of so, sad. But I'll, I'll let sad. Kevin take ahead, over. Kevin. Take yeah. over. Lang. So speaking of Lang, he seems to be in charge of the brigade at a lot of the critical moments. Yeah. And throughout the entire course of the war and mm. with Brevard and others coming in, he's going to be captured right near the end. So at Appomattox, Lang is back in charge of the Florida Brigade for that final, you know, solemn duty. Yeah. That he's going to go in. He gets married after the war, has a bunch of little kids throwing. And when Perry becomes governor, Lang is right there by his side. I think he's like adjutant general or something like that is the title that he's going to yeah, have. Yeah, adjutant general. Yeah. yeah. So he serves significantly in government and he takes big involvement in reigniting the Florida militia movement. Kind of an early pre. He sometimes gets credit as like an early precursor of the Florida National Guard. Okay, kind of establishing that. Okay, and he lives a really nice long life. And fortunately for us, what that allows is not only extensive correspondence with Batchelder and others that help to piece things together, but he comes back as one of the Florida commissioners here in 1895 to stroll the battlefield and lay out stakes, walk it all, place mm. where a monument's going to go, and place these temporary, you know, Florida advance markers. Things that, as far as I know, there's no evidence of anything yeah. of them existing on the field today, but they firmly believe there will be a monument there. And Lang is one of those three here. Huh. He takes it to like 1917. Yeah, it dies in 1917. Wow. Yeah, he oh, took the wow. live long and prosper literally. <laughs> well. what's, what's always interesting about those soldiers that live into the 1917 and 18 or beyond, L. Delbert Ames lives much beyond, they get to see World War One. Yes. And I wonder what they think about that. I, I always wonder that too. Did you ever see that old film clip I'm assuming it's from the 75th anniversary here. Uh, no. Well, I don't know what it's from, but it, there's a Civil War veteran with a, at the time, currently sir, or co with a contemporary soldier, um, World War One era, and he's showing him a water-cooled machine gun. Have you ever seen this? And I just, it's a very short clip I've seen. I, I don't remember where. I've seen it several places, but so it's out there. But I just, every time I see it, I just go, I wonder what that old codger was thinking when he saw that. Yeah. Now, probably nothing, because they had a Gatlin gun in the Civil War. I mean, they had Gatlin guns in the Civil War. I'm sure at some point after the Civil War, he had seen or heard of them because they were a little more prevalent. Did they have a Gatlin gun? No, I'm, th th it was it was developed by that point, oh, yeah, is yeah, what yeah, I yeah. mean. Um, but then it was later adopted in the army, yeah, and then yeah. you know the, the just the, he saw the progression of firearms. I guess is yeah, what I'm saying, yeah. from you know the single shot muzzle loaders to the repeaters, and then the machine guns. Um, and so maybe it wouldn't have been that big of a deal to him. To us, you know, we think this guy took a nap from 1865 to the moment he saw that machine gun and woke up old, and you know missed everything. But it's not only that. They see planes at this point. Yeah. I mean, the advances that they see, it's just, I wonder what they think. That's, it's always fascinating. Some of them live into the atomic era. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Mind-blowing. The ability yeah. to just wipe a city off the planet. Yeah. Yeah, they see, yeah, they see a lot of change. Yeah. A lot of change. And, uh. I mean, I think back to when I was a kid, how I tell my kids, you know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, <laughs> after we got done walking 10 miles in the snow, uh, when we got home, we went outside and played. And that was the big thing. Yeah. If you got in trouble, parents took away your playtime, and that was big. We didn't have a phone. We didn't know what a computer was and all this. So mm -hmm. I just, and now today we got all this nonsense, and I, you know, that's just small compared to what they, yeah. you know, the eras they lived in. Uh, yeah, and, and I think of that too. I think of like the big changes since when I was a kid, and it's like they're not that substantial. Not compared to what they used no, to be. The leaps no. aren't as big. They're not as big. I mean, I had to go home to see who was trying to get a hold of me all day, and then I had to talk on a phone that was tethered to a wall. Yeah. And I only had so far to go unless I got a really long cable or cord, and then I could go even further. And eventually that would stretch out where it wouldn't coil right anymore. <laughs> That's <funny. laughs> you know, and uh, and you know if you called someone it was busy and then they developed call waiting and then you know but uh, but that was kind of rude. 
I, you know, it's just all these different things. And now it's like I walk around with my phone, and the phone is the le- the least used function on this stupid thing that I carry around with me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and people don't know how to talk on the phone anymore. They prefer to do text message, or they 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 text you and you call them, and they reject the call literally a second after you, they texted you. <laughs> And it's like, don't you think if I'm texting you or if I'm calling you and not texting you, there's a reason I'd rather talk to you yeah. than do this through text? But no, they can't handle the talking. It's really weird. The, the big, you know what the drastic changes we've witnessed, I think, are is the dehumanification of humanity. Like those human interactions I agree. are all yeah. effed up it's, it's because sort of sad. Of, it's horrible. And we wonder why society stinks. Yeah, because we don't we know how to, to be ourselves. people. We did. Yeah. We did. We, they put this beautiful little drug in our hands, Yep. and we all said, give me more, give me more, give me so more. So in 50 years, people are going to have neck problems because <laughs> their, their head's bent over yeah. all the time. You and know? carpal tunnel. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. It's terrible. But here at Addressing Gettysburg, you can always slink back into the past with us, 180 years. And if you ever decide that maybe someday you want to actually experience the past what can you do, Kevin? You can get out of the car. <laughs> Let's, uh, real quick, yeah. there was another Florida brigade, the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Okay. They're later on. Um, <laughs> but this Florida brigade under Lang that we're talking about here at Gettysburg, it makes it to Appomattox. Yeah. Yeah, the one like 150 soldiers, maybe. It's, yeah, there's It's not a much. small group, but they. They're there for the duration. They're just so small. That's sad. But they make it to the yeah. end. I mean, they, you know, another oddity of the this, this Civil War to me is if you're fighting in that last week, you're a Confederate, fighting in the last week, you're down at Five Forks or, or wherever, uh, and you get captured, you've got to wait till probably June or so to go home. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you make it that final week to Appomattox... As soon as you sign the paperwork, you can hightail it out of there right. and leave. Yeah. So it I paid th- to make it. I always thought being the first or the last guy to die in a war is like the worst. You know, first, because you don't really get to see. You don't know how it turns out. Yeah. Last, because you do know how it turns out. Whether you win or lose, now it's time to go home and you die. Yeah. You know? So speaking of that, though, the last survivor of the Florida brigade here is here at the 75th anniversary oh yeah yeah still hanging around yeah. into the 1940s Jeez. Yep. so you still got that one out of the 740 whatever yeah things you follow with it who's still hanging around across yeah. that, that and and again kind of taking it you're not just the last person in a war but you're the last of everybody right that you served with and right. knowing by the 1940s you know there's not very many in general still hanging around veterans exactly it's just amazing to make it through You've made it through the war, and now you got to survive the peace. You make it through sickness, any, you know, any residual effects that the war might have on your health. You survive all that, and you know, I don't like sickles, but it is amazing to me. He lives as long as he does. He's missing a leg. Um, now he lived a better life than Joe Private out there, but still, with the medical techniques of the day, they survive all that and just keep going through life. It's just. Their resiliency is amazing. Well, I think it, it, on that note, I think of guys like Hancock and Chamberlain who have those gnarly wounds in the groinal region. And, you know, like Chamberlain's walking around. I think, uh, I don't know if they ever undid this, but he has like a glass tube connecting the severed part of his urethra. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how how painful is that? And, and, and there's pictures of him post-war as an old man on horseback. I mean, that just sounds like that would kind of hurt, <laughs> given the wounds yeah. that he had. And I think the effects of Hancock's wound eventually kill him. Yeah, yeah, I think, know, he, yeah. he definitely gains a lot of weight. Um, he gets the beatus, doesn't he? he probably, yeah. I know he. I'm you know, Winfield Hancock. If he'd have won the presidency, he wouldn't have lasted the full term. If he dies at the same time, yeah, so it's complications from that wound still. But yeah. to live into the 40s and show back up here, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm it from Florida. And then think about what he's experiencing, too, adding to maybe a different type of wound. Because by that point, a big part of the narrative of the battle is ingrained. And that narrative is 
Florida didn't go as far forward. Right. Florida are cowards. Or Florida, at least, is not going to be remembered right. on the same way. Your monument, well, not that it even had a monument at that point, but there's nothing significantly marking where your unit was. Your story is not being elevated in the top. Like, which is some of the exact same stuff that Lang was trying to fight about in his life, that why are we being overwritten? Yeah. Connecting back to right and others like, no one's remembering our story. We're the forgotten brigade here. And I still think that's largely true on the sure. battlefield today. Knowing where the monument is, what can you see from there? There's no reason most of us would ever have casually to stop unless we're intentionally right. trying to check out yeah. this regiment or this brigade. I remember the first time I saw the Florida monument, I just thought it was weird because I didn't realize, you know, I was young at the time. I didn't realize that <laughs> Florida was a state. <laughs> I just assumed Disney invented Florida, you know? Um, and so, like, I, it, for, I no, it, it wasn't that. It, I wasn't surprised it was a state. I knew it was a state. It, I just didn't think of it as a state that was part of the Confederacy. Right. Yeah, it just didn't, like, but, compute. Because you never hear about Florida in history, really, until Walt decides to build a park there. But it does have Fort Pickens down there, mm-hmm. which is one of the big forts in the beginning. Well, it has a lot it, of stuff down there. Well, they're contesting over these. Oh, forts. yeah. Fort yeah. Sumter and Fort Moultrie and uh, Fort Pickett was the other one. That the federal tr- troops had occupied, and they're contesting over that in the very beginning. So, yeah, when we're talking about Florida in the war, don't think about modern Florida. Right. Like, it's completely different, sort of everything across the spectrum. Sure. Well, that's the point. Yeah. yeah. It's, like you were saying before, knows. it's the panhandle and mm-hmm. just south of Georgia. It's not all that other. People are surprised, though. Oh, we didn't talk about the one guy. Uh, people are surprised that Florida was here. Well, you know? and that was the second thing. Yeah. Not and, only were they part of the Confederacy, that, that surprised me, but they were here. Because yeah. until that point, now I'll admit, at that stage, I don't know if I had even read one book about the battle yet. Like, I was still early on post-movie uh, viewing uh, years, like maybe the first two or three years. So I didn't really know much about anything. But that that Florida was here, yeah, it just seemed weird to me. It's akin to, to me, in my mind, it's akin to you keep driving down uh, Confederate Avenue and on your right pops up this giant monument to Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. And they got one regiment here, the third, but they got a big old monument. Yeah. Was Arkansas here? <laughs> Not too many people talk about Arkansas. You right, know right. Saying? Yeah, that's so, a good uh, point, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't talk about the most infamous soldier. Yeah, we're going to get in trouble. In the, in the, in oh, I was going to I was going to say cuz we did an episode on that and I meant to do that before but I got sidetracked. Go ahead. So, uh there's a soldier who happens to be named Lewis. Uh, <laughs> not related <laughs> to me. It helps me remember his name though. Uh Lewis Powell. Hmm. And he is um he's wounded probably on the second day I think in his right hand. And he becomes a prisoner of war, and he gets shipped off to a hospital in Baltimore, and there's a nurse up there with Southern Sympathies that helps him escape, and he leaves that hospital. So he never makes it to a POW camp. And then he heads down to where I live um, in Northern Virginia and rides around with John Mosby for a while in 1864, and eventually he leaves that group also. But in April of 1865, he winds up in this group of uh, individuals, shady type, hanging out at Mary Surratt's boarding house. Um, named John Wilkes Booth. So when they plot to basically decapitate the federal government, Mm. because it's not just Lincoln. Lincoln gets killed, but they're going to take out Grant, but they see Grant leaving town that day to go visit his kids in New Jersey. They want to take out Johnson. The guy supposed to do that gets drunk and never does anything. (laughs) And they want to take out Secretary of State William Seward, and that task falls to Lewis Powell, now going under the name of Lewis Payne. And he tries to, he, he, he gets to the house under the guise of delivering medicine because Seward, a couple weeks prior to this, had had a carriage accident and fractured his jaw. So he's in bed recuperating from that. Powell shows up uh, delivering medicine that, you know, they, they're not letting him in because who's this guy? He's not the doctor or anything. We didn't know about him medicine. So he, he, Bull rushes his way in. He pistol whips Seward's son named Frederick, gives him a concussion. Uh, And then he goes and he tries to stab Seward to death. Um, I don't know if the injury he sustains in his right hand affects his ability to do some stabbing. Maybe it does. But what does affect uh, things is Seward has this this, um, metal plate on his jaw to keep it stabilized, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. 
but I think that protects the jaw, and he's trying to hit it, and I think the blade might hit that a couple times. But Seward is able to roll off the bed, get in between the bed and the wall, and that's what saves his life. Right. Powell figures he's been there long enough. He leaves. Um, Doesn't the daughter interfere somehow? Maybe. Something about a daughter. I'm, his I'm, daughter is there. Yeah. Um, or daughter or daughter-in-law is there. Um, so it's, there's other people there. I think if they made a movie about it today, the daughter would come in and kung fu fight him. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but in reality, I yeah. don't think that's what happened. But there, I, there's something about the a daughter that I'm... Yeah. Um, but Powell escapes. I read one version. He heads... He gets caught in a um, cemetery, but most of the versions that I've I've read says he goes back to Mary Surratt's house, and that's where they pick him up. But the the, the next Gettysburg uh, connection is he goes on trial. It's a military tribunal. They're going to try these people. They're all going to be hung. There's no way they're going to... This ain't OJ. Mm. Um, (laughs) So... (laughs) But they're going to have a trial, and he needs a lawyer. Right. His lawyer ends up being William Doster, who here at Gettysburg is commander of the 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And so, you know, I I watched uh, a few true crime shows, not everything, because some of it's just junk. But I watched Dateline in 2020, and inevitably a murder, he's going to have a trial. Big Keith Morrison fans, right? Oh, I love Keith Morrison. And Lewis Powell got a lawyer. Yeah. And what a day it was. A tall, was handsome dead. man yeah. <laughs> who fought at Gettysburg would later go on <laughs> to infamy. <laughs> but Lewis <before> Powell. <laughs> um, but he gets William Dobster, <laughs> and that's his defense lawyer. And on these shows that I mentioned, that sometimes it's beyond me how the, the defense lawyers get up there with a straight face and try to prove somebody's innocence yeah. or a shot, you know, reasonable doubt. Like, you got to know the line. How do you do this? William Doster does it. But he tries to cl- claim that Lewis Powell was insane. And if you look at pictures of him, he looks kind of kooky to me. Yeah. He's a big guy. He's, I think he's probably the most photographed out of all of them that mm-hmm. get caught. Uh, he's a big-looking, burly guy, and he looks slightly off his rocker. So I, I'm not saying that Doster was wrong. I think he might have been insane yeah. to fall in and think this is going to work. But they're not having any of it, and he gets hung. So, um, but his lawyer, who puts up a, a viable defense, was here at Gettysburg also. Did uh, uh, did you know that uh, online um, in the little Civil War community here, he's considered a sex symbol, Lewis Powell? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Oh. The 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 shot of him up against the turret yeah, on the yeah. boat, like kind of leaning back, like looking like, yeah, come here, baby, you know. Ladies like that. Oh huh? boy. Wow. You should see the comments. When there's a picture of that posted up there, just go look at the comments. You know, I'm gonna start giving my tour standing like that. Oh. <laughs> I'm Lewis. <laughs> From an insane guy named Lewis. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's crazy. It's like the ladies who write prisoners, you know, murder. Well, that's it's along those lines. Remember after the Boston bombing and Rolling Stone put the, the surviving brother on uh, the cover and women were going nuts for him. Really? Oh, my God. He was that, so yeah. dreamy. He was so cute. He's the Jim Morrison of, you know, terrorists. And, oh, it was disgusting. That is. That's yeah. I, you know, I, I see uh, somebody, who, and if I know that they commit a crime, uh, that face looks creepy to me all of a sudden. I don't care how good looking it is. The minute I know what they've done, that face warps in my mind. He looks like a mean dude to me. The kid? No. Or Powell. Powell. Oh, I wouldn't want to mess with him. I don't know what the kid looks like. What was he, like 6'4", 6'5"? Hey, big. He's a big guy. No wonder he got shot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he stands out. Yeah. Big guy. Yeah. So. He's lucky he just got shot in the hand. Or wherever. Well, if he got killed, I think they find somebody else to do what he did. But he yes, yeah. we don't know him. He's just a a non known, you know. Right. He just would have been a non uh, an anonymous, anonymous yeah, casualty. Dead guy. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's not how history worked in that case. Do you have anything to add to that? I I, no, I just took over the story because I did. Uh, one of the, I think maybe the first episode I ever did on here was... Uh, it was. The Connections to the Lincoln. Connections. It was over at the old radio station when we had the studio there. Was it? Yeah. I remember. We took a break and went to lunch. It was you, me, and Bob, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. I do. I just remember we did that episode. Um, that's it. Yeah. It was early on. I know it was in the uh, winter time. Anyway. 
Yeah, it was in the wintertime. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, uh, that's about it for today's show, ladies and gentlemen. See, we only had two questions, but we filled a little bit more time with uh, banter and other exciting things. Kevin Bryant is a licensed battlefield guide. Uh, Kevin, I hope you come back on the show more. I really enjoyed having you on. Just change okay. your voice, I guess. Yeah, just, just doesn't yeah. bother me. I like it. Yeah. No, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too, but you know, you can't outshine the host. That, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, but you did. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to have you on again if you don't mind. And uh, that's about it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your support. Thank you for continuing to listen. Thank you to our patrons for the questions. And we will talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. Thank you. All right. Very good. Go, good. Good first time, Kevin. Very good. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the Badge Maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S. says, the badge maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts of scout have got a stain, for soon tis known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, damn